the trouble that's caused by the presence of billionaires and huge inequality in our society. You know, it's interesting because there's actually a lot of new books out about the very rich. Uh, but, but, but most of them are, are kind of, you know, about what exciting, glamorous lives they live and what, how fantastic their contribution is to society and all that sort of thing. In fact, there's one new book out. This is even after the Wall Street crash. There's a new book out about John Paulson, who's one of those hedge fund managers. This guy earns $3.7 billion dollars betting against the subprime mortgage market and therefore in the process helping to trigger the world financial meltdown, uh, giving him kind of the world record uh, for profiting from the misery of others. Uh, but you know, so you would think if there was a book about this guy uh, written by a Wall Street Journal reporter, you know, they might find something critical to say about him, you know, given all the misery he caused in the world. Uh, but in fact, the book is all full of excitement and, yeah, in fact, you get a sense of it, you know, how exciting it is. This guy made so much money. Uh, you get a sense of it from the title. The title is, title is The Greatest Trade Ever, uh, which I think reflects the kind of excitement in financial markets. But my guess is that outside of financial markets, out in the real world, this real sentiment towards these big billionaires is probably more reflected uh, in the placard carried by the protesters who marched down Wall Street, the placard said, Jump, you fuckers! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I just want to emphasize that, that our book fits more into the jump, you fuckers genre of books about, about the rich. Now, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the, the tragedy that I see happening today, uh, you know, that all that anger out there, that anger against these billionaires, is unfortunately kind of been seized by the right. And the right is, of course, manipulating and maneuvering it and using it to advance their own agenda towards greater inequality. And I guess in addition to trying to tell you about my book, I also want to talk to you as fellow progressives uh, and urge you that we have to start fighting back and that we have to much more aim ourselves at taking control of that anger that is out there and turning it instead to fighting for more social justice. And, and let me just say <laughs> that there's, you know, there's a precedent for this and that is if you want to go back to the late 1920s to the period before the crash in 1929. It was a period a little bit like, like the period we have now, tremendous inequality, tremendous uh, rich uh, gathering of money at the top, rich dominated society. And then the 1929 crash came, like the 2008 crash, followed by a brutal recession, depression in fact. But the difference was that back then there was plenty of anger, but it was seized and taken control of and maneuvered by progressives and by others in the labor movement and it was used to change society in a much more positive direction. In fact, uh, what happened as a result in the uh, period after the depression and the early post-war years was that labor was empowered, labor made significant gains and that had the effect actually of really pushing up the whole middle class uh, so you had a period of much greater equality. Now I don't want to uh, distort the picture, it was a period of capitalism and capitalism always has a, a small elite at the top, but it was a period of a very different kind of capitalism. It was a capitalism where the benefits were much more widely shared and for that reason it was often referred to as the golden age of capitalism. And interestingly, it was a period uh, where there was much more equality, much higher taxes on the rich, and also much higher economic growth. In, in fact, what, what's interesting, because we've seen a dramatic swing back to the pre-1929 period starting since 1980, 
But if you just look at one set of numbers, you can see the story in a nutshell. And that is, if you look at the share of the national income that was enjoyed by the top 1%, by the richest 1%, before 1929, the top 1% had 24% of all the income. It's a huge amount. After the Depression and the Second World War and the rise of labor power and the changes that happened, that top 1%, their share of the national income dropped from 24% down to 9%. Yeah, exactly. And it's not like that money disappeared. What happened was, what that 9% reflects is that the money was redistributed to other parts of society. That's essentially the rise of the middle class right there. Sadly, as I say, after 1980, the rich start getting aggressive again to roll the clock back to the pre-1929 period. And now we have a situation where the top 1% is back to having 24% of all the national income, like they did prior to 1929. Now those are the numbers for the US. Let me quickly say the, no the pattern for Canada is similar, not quite as extreme, but it was 16% the top 1% had before 1929 in Canada, dropped down to 7% in those early post-war years, and is now back up to 16% again. So the same pattern of extreme inequality, real change for egalitarianism and equality, higher taxes on the rich, and then since 1980, a return to extreme inequality. So for instance, you know, in the early post-war period between 1945 and 1980, the average CEO uh, was making 20 to 30 times what the average worker was making. That's a huge difference, right? 20, 30 times more. But today, the average CEO is making 200 to 300 times what the average worker is making. And if you look in the financial sector, it's even worse. You know, in the financial sector, last year, after the 2008 crash, the average of the top 25 hedge fund managers was, and this is an average of them, they, they made, on average, they each made $1 billion. Essentially what we've seen is a momentous transfer of income and wealth from the middle class and the poor to the very richest members of society. I would argue that to, to too great an extent, we've been on the defensive. And we have to become far more aggressive because we, we've tended to shy away from actually challenging the growing concentration of wealth itself, you know, and focusing more on specific issues. And I think there's been a tendency to think that, you know, the concentration of wealth at the top it is kind of a side issue and we should be focusing on sort of, you know, fighting specific issues. But I want to argue that in fact it's not a side issue that the rich have so much money and that there's so much wealth concentrated at the top. That in fact it's the very root of the problem and that we won't really That, you know, that we won't really be able to fight back properly and address all those other areas that we want to make progress in unless we do something to clip the power of the rich. Um, you know, their political clout because of their money is simply so extreme that among other things they, they simply block, they're able to block efforts at income redistribution. In fact, they're able to push through efforts to redistribute wealth in the opposite direction. Um, it's interesting, this is sometimes called the Robin Hood paradox, that the richer the rich get, you would think maybe the more generous they would be, uh, but it doesn't work that way. Uh, what happens is the richer the rich get, the more powerful they are, and they're politically, because that economic clout gives them political clout, and therefore the more able they are to put in place their agenda, which is to block anything in the way of transfers 
uh, or redistribution downward. Uh, and, and of course, we've seen that in the last three decades. As the rich have gotten richer and richer, they have simply become more and more aggressive. And we see this, you see this in your labor struggles where they're getting increasingly aggressive to actually take benefits away and take away important things that you've won through, through hard bargaining and hard fighting on the picket line. The other thing they do with the use their financial, or their enormous financial clout for is to push for deregulation in financial markets, which is of course something they, is very dear to their heart because then they can do more financial speculation. And it's not, it's not totally coincidental that the period before 1929 and the period before 2008, both of those are periods of extreme concentration of wealth at the top and the rich using their financial clout to press for deregulation leading, financial deregulation leading to the terrible crashes on Wall Street with all their disastrous impacts. Um, in fact, as long as the rich are as powerful as they are, they're going to block just about every progressive change. I mean, if you think about just about any issue, even things like climate change, nuclear disarmament, environments, environmental sustainability, you know, to a large extent, the world kind of acknowledges we have to make progress in these areas. And yet, somehow, progress is never made because there's a tiny group of very powerful individuals very wealthy individuals, very wealthy corporate interests that are blocking those interests. In fact, I think, uh, uh, you know, the real problem is as long as the rich are as powerful and wealthy as they are, we're not really going to have anything in the way of meaningful democracy. Uh, there, there was a famous U.S. Supreme Court judge, Louis Brandeis, in the early 1900s, who put it beautifully. He said, we can have democracy or we can have concentration of wealth in the hands of a small number, but we can't have both. And I think that well, pretty well sums it up. So I would argue what is needed is that we have to go much more on the offensive. And we have to mount a powerful campaign that challenges the very moral legitimacy of such a small group in society having so much money and therefore having so much political power. You know, we have to realize that there's no reason for us to be on the defensive and to be afraid of looking like we're waging a kind of politics of envy as it's time sometimes suggested. That in fact, ours is a principled position. We're in favor of sharing. We're in favor of, of benefits for all, society and in the interests of the common good. It's them that should be on the defensive. They're the ones that favor privilege and elitism and the benefits of the few over the many. Now, I would argue that this moral campaign that we have to wage uh, should also in include some very specific proposals, uh, you know, that it would be designed to take money and wealth away from the rich. And the perfect way to do that is through the tax system. Uh, in fact, if that sounds too radical, let me remind you that even uh, a Republican, uh, Theodore Roosevelt in 1906, argued in favor of, uh, he was in favor of a tax, who, he said, whose primary objective would be to, uh, to constantly put increasing pressure on the inheritances of the swollen fortunes, which it is certainly of no benefit to this country to perpetuate. Now, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could hear something like that from Jack Layton? <laughs> anyway, uh, so in the book we have, we have at the end, you know, re uh, recommendations about exactly how we could restore high taxes that were in place in the, you know, that early post-war period. You know, the top marginal tax rate in that period that I talked about between 1945 and 1980 the top marginal tax rate in Canada, the rate at which the rich pay, you know, when they're very high up the income scale, was 80%. You know what it is in, in Canada now? 46%. There's lots of room to push that back up. Uh, meanwhile, corporate taxes, we're cutting corporate taxes. Uh, they, the corporate taxes were at 18% in 2000, now they're down, sorry, they were 28%, now they're down to 
They're going to continue to be cut down to 15% over the next few years. And by the way, you know when they, when McGinty's talking about freezing the pay uh, of public sector workers and we have to do that to contribute to the deficit, well the interesting thing is that the province at the same time they're asking public sector workers to freeze the pay and give up what amounts to about a thousand dollars for somebody making 25,000 a year, let's say as a nursing home worker, uh, that, that money actually isn't going into paying off the deficit. That money is actually going into pay for the corporate tax cuts. You know, so, and, and, and that is something we should be morally outraged about and that should be very much part of our moral campaign. Uh, by the way, just a quick final point about the, the solutions on the tax front. We should bring back an inheritance tax. Do you realize we're one of the few countries in the Western world that doesn't have an inheritance tax and it only affects the top 1%. We used to have one in this country, but we quietly cancelled it in 1972. If we brought it back and collected money through it from the top 1% at the same rate that many other Western, most other Western countries do, do you realize we'd have enough money that we could establish educational trust funds for every Canadian child so that when a child turns 16 in Canada, $16,000 would be deposited into his or her bank account to be used exclusively for education or training. Think of how that would change this country. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm short on time here, so I'm just going to quickly wrap up by giving a little bit of good news, because I like to leave on good news. Um, and that is that despite the power of billionaires, Canadians, this is still a democracy, and Canadians actually care about equality and they care about preserving our strong social safety network and our strong social programs or what used to be strong social programs. Now sure, if you ask Canadians, uh, do you want a tax cut? Do you want some chocolate? Do you want some ice cream? You know, if you ask them like that, they'll say yes. But if you ask them, to choose, and there's polls that do this, do you want a tax cut or do you want to see that money reinvested in health care, in education, in pensions, in all kinds of things that are incredibly important to the middle class? If you ask that question, by overwhelming margins, typically over 80%, you find Canadians saying, yes, I want social reinvestment. In fact, here, here's, the, here's the fascinating thing, you know, sometimes you get the impression from the media that everybody out there is suffering from tax rage. In fact, almost nobody's suffering from tax rage. In fact, just a very small, tiny group is suffering from ta tax rage. And I'm going to identify that group to you right now. That group is rich, older men. Now you may wonder how it is I know that, but this is based on research. And I, uh, the research is that, I don't know if you're familiar with the publication, it's called The Wealthy Boomer. Comes out every now and then in the National Post. It's a very odd little publication. It consists of just two things, articles about tax rage and ads for Viagra. <laughs> So, you know, this makes me wonder, does tax rage cause erectile dysfunction? <laughs> or does erectile dysfunction cause tax rage? <laughs> anyway, the point is the right is impotent. Uh, actually, unfortunately, that's not quite true. Uh, the right is not impotent, the, but the point is neither are we. And it's time that we really started fighting back to limit the wealth and power of billionaires. Thank you very much. Woo.